Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Amoral Philosopher podcast. Uh, we continue to talk about philosophy of religion uh, with our guest, Dima Jiva. Uh, welcome back, Dima. Glad to be here. So our today's episode is on definitions and on the burden of proof. So we'll talk about definitions of religion, theism and atheism, God, and perhaps some other concepts. We don't really have a script for the episode, as for all episodes in this series. So we'll see where the discussion will take us and if there will be not sufficient time to cover all the topics that we come across in, in uh, this time around. Uh, this may actually turn into several episodes, but let's see how much progress we can make. So again, we'll start with the definitions and then we'll talk a little bit about the burden of proof when it comes to arguments for and against God's existence. So to start us off, I think since this is in um, this is the series on philosophy of religion. Let's talk a little bit about what we mean by religion. Yeah. So, Dima, what what do we mean by that? <laughs> right, and and we're starting with a tough one. Um, yeah, in philosophy in general, um, very often um, when philosophers are seeking for a definition, um, they might aim for something really grand which is uh, a very precise identification of a set of necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for something's being a particular kind of thing. Um, so famously, for example, in epistemology, um, the search for the definition of knowledge. What are these elusive set of necessary and sufficient conditions to, for something to count as knowledge? And uh, there is no consensus on that. It's actually really, really hard to find those for pretty much any complex concept and religion is no exception. And so I, I, think, it, I think it would be more fruitful uh, to approach it uh, as I guess Wittgenstein would. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein was someone who sort of really try to humble the philosophers who are attempting to define concepts very, very precisely and tell them that perhaps a better approach is in the vicinity and their original goal might not be achievable. And so the approach that he would suggest is something called family resemblance. Wittgenstein proposed to um, approach the definition of important concepts by the analogy of, of a family resemblance. That uh, instead of looking for a particular feature that all instantiations of some concept must necessarily share, rather we should allow for a variety of features to be shared in a, in a in different sort of way. So for example, um, let's say you have a family and you have four children and let their names be a b c and d and let's say that um a b and c uh have red hair and d has brown hair right so and so a b and c are similar to each other with respect to the color of their hair uh but are not but d doesn't it doesn't have the same kind of hair right but at the same time, it could, it could be that uh, B and D um, share a particular feature of the skull that, that, um, that are similar to their parents, right? Or uh, it could be that three of them, D, A, and C, but not B, have particular kind of elongated noses, right? So you can have features, uh, multiple features that are had by a number of relatives, right, within a family. And it could even turn out that there is no single feature that all members of that family share together. And yet they all constitute one single family, right? right. So, and that family resemblance might be all we need in order yeah. to yeah. define um, our, our concept, yeah. right? So, to extend that a, a bit to other examples. So for example, um, um, the concept of a game is, is a difficult one to define um, in the rigorous kind of way in which philosophers try to do it in the past. For example, if, if you're trying to find the, the necessary and sufficient condition for something's being a game, you might be disappointed. So let, let me give you an example of the proposed uh, 
condition. Um, something is a game only if there is competition involved. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. You can play a game of cards, a game of solitaire, and there is no competition involved. You're the only player. Mm -hmm. um, some suggested that games are defined by the fact that they are all for recreational purposes. And that's also not true. We have professional players, right, that earn their living from, say, playing football or rugby. And uh, it's to it's, they, they would not call that <laughs> recreational yeah. activity. This is their job, right? Yeah. So there is a difficulty in sort of in finding that, that single feature that all games must possess to be counted as yeah. such. And, and, but instead what we can do is sort of point to all sorts of features that in many ways over, uh, that, that many instances of the kind in this, in this case, or the concept in this case, a game, um, kind of overlap and share, and that might be enough uh, for our purposes. So to bring that all back to our query, what about religion, right? And if it yeah. is a family resemblance uh, concept, sort of what kind of general depiction we could give it, right? And um, so I thought that perhaps, uh, let me just offer one that I found most helpful. And again, this is not gonna be super, like absolutely perfectly satisfying, but here it goes. Let me try to remember it. Um, a religion involves a communal, transmittable body of teachings and prescribed practices about an ultimate sacred reality or a state of being um, that calls for reverence and awe. Right. And that's a mouthful. This there. Body, I'm, I'm impressed that you were able again? to. That's a mouthful, Larry. I'm impressed you were able to <laughs> sure. commit that to memory. Uh, yeah. Would you like me to to carry on, or, or do you have some? No, some, no, no. Some please, carry about it? please carry on. Yeah, just let me just finish that. Yeah. That I'm I'm using this definition uh, from. Uh, this definition comes from uh, dictionary of philosophy of religion. I, I thought it would be appropriate to share it. So, and that body guides its practitioners um, towards um, what it describes as a saving, illuminating, emancipatory relationship to this reality, right? So mm. the features there are community, transmittability, connection to ultimate reality, a sense of awe, um, and certain practices and teachings that are involved in all of that. So that would be a kind of general depiction of what's involved without this high lofty uh, sort of uh, ambition of yeah. nailing it all down uh, uh, definitively. Yeah, sorry, you know, just to back up a little bit, yes. to, to come back of to course, the definition. Yeah. So I guess his problem with that definition would yeah. be something like, well, you're trying to enumerate this different necessary and sufficient condition for what religion is. But if you look at yes. the example of all the religions that exist in the world, you won't be able to find one single condition that is shared by all of them. So there's more of like yes. a summary resemblance between them. So Christianity might be a little bit like Islam in a way, and Islam might be a little bit like yes. Buddhism. But for instance, Buddhism and Christianity might not have too much to share together. Um, right. So that approach does not really work. And so his suggestion is instead to uh, sort of hold this family resemblance view. Yes. But then, the problem of the family resemblance view could be that, well, how do we define if, you know, with the family, for instance, we know how to unite members of one family together because they have certain bonds and they share family names and other things. Right. Whereas with religions, can it be that it's a little bit arbitrary if there is just a number of different practices that people have around the world? And they don't really have even one feature together. And we sort of want to lump them all together in yeah. one. Would it be a bit arbitrary? Isn't there a risk that will include something that, you know, shouldn't be, shouldn't count as a religion? Absolutely. And that's right. And that there, there will be these uh, borderline cases that will be up for a debate. Exactly right. And I think, so let me just, before I say something to your, uh, to your question, by your question, um, one example of like sort of the attempt to find this this single thread throughout 
So would be, for instance, that some defined religion as necessarily involving a belief in a supernatural entity. That, that to be a religion, you have to believe that there is a God or there are gods. And that immediately is problematic, for instance, uh, because it disqualifies Buddhism, mm. which is a bona fide instance of religion, right? Um, yeah. It would disqualify that from out of this religion, but that's counter to how we use the concept uh, or how we use the term rather, right? Religion. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, we have widely shared um, intuitions about um, how to use the term. And indeed we use that successfully with respect to a number of cases and we would call them clear cut cases, cases that should um, be used as a, as a test for any further analysis of the concept right for any further theoretical definition um if they if they don't match the clear-cut cases of what is a religion which includes buddhism mm -hmm. well too bad for your definition and so um but you're exactly right even the definition i just offered from from this from the dictionary of philosophy, uh, philosophy of religion it has problems like it, it insists on communal aspect but there are certain traditions, or if you can even call them traditions, um, cults, I guess, uh, like Scientology, or certain other uh, sects that have a very individualistic approach to, to their practice. Mm -hmm. And so community just isn't a big deal for mm -hmm. such, uh, for, for such uh, practices. And if that's the case, uh, you know, should we lump it together with, with um, Christianity, Islam, and so on? Mm -hmm. and, or, not, or another feature that might be lacking in such cults would be transmittability, right? Like cargo cult, for instance, uh, um, would lack that. So, so you have a sort of a puzzle there, but I think the best you can do if you have to offer some kind of general depiction would be to look at clear cut cases and try to say something generally true about them. And I think that this uh, goal, the definition I offered meets. Yeah. But you're exactly right. The whole point of family resemblance is that the concepts are not themselves precise enough. Yeah. Because they're ultimately based on our use. And given how variously we might use the concept and, and that you know, through continued practice, right? Mm -hmm. Solidifies itself. Uh, very much that you just end up with the borderline problems of, of that content. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we move on, can I just throw in some idea right. about how we could define religion? Uh, and I'm sure yeah. you'll, you'll probably show that there are counterexamples to that. But so me personally, when I think about religion, mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that sets it apart from sort of other kind of activities and worldviews, and I'm thinking here about, you know, science and philosophy, is that right. when I think about religion, I think a lot about sort of beliefs that don't require some stringent justification, where a person is ready to accept a certain practice or a certain belief or a certain worldview um, based on... Um, based on a belief that wouldn't stand scrutiny uh, if it was a, uh, you know, a scientific belief or a, you know, a philosophical right. position. So in other words, it, it seems to me that for someone to accept a religious belief, the warrant for that belief is a little bit relaxed in a way. Would yeah. you think that's at least one feature that can be shared by all religions or would there be some counterexamples to that as well? Yeah, I certainly think that that is perhaps a popular perception of what's going on. Well, misconception. Least, yeah, but I would argue that it is. I, I yeah. think that um, especially, I mean, let's think of the recent phenomenon of, of the new atheists, right? That right. people like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, like Christopher Hitchens, uh, Daniel Dennett. Uh, these guys uh, wanted uh, to dismiss religion as a serious uh, cognitive activity. And they wanted to define 
faith in tendentious ways. Uh, they wanted to say that faith is acceptance of certain propositions in, 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 in the teeth of evidence. In other words, you, you, you are, it's, it's necessarily blind. The very definition of faith is that it's delusional and so on. And I think that's an unhelpful way uh, to approach it in, in this sense. It might turn out that ultimately religion is not justified. In other words, once we're, we're gonna subject it to serious philosophical scrutiny, uh, let's say, and this is this is this comes home to me. Let's say Christianity just isn't true, um, as far as it's uh, the propositions that it involves. Um, now that's that's right. Uh, it might turn out that that it's it's uh, it's false, right? Uh, or there are problems that are uh, irremediable, right? You can't redeem them. Uh, at the same time. Uh, that's the conclusion of a philosophical investigation. This is not part of the very definition of Christianity, that it is contradictory, that it uh, lacks justification for the claims that it makes. Um, and so I think that the, the, the reason why I guess I would reject the definition as, as, a, as a Christian would be that I, I think that there are good reasons to be a Christian. I think that Christianity does uh, stand up to that philosophical scrutiny and does fairly well when it's subjected to that philosophical scrutiny. And I don't think I would be a Christian or remain a Christian if it didn't in my case. I have a, as you know, a very inquisitive mind. I, I doubt things, I think about things, and it matters to me whether the religion I subscribe to can meet the evidential burden or that it can meet the challenges leveled against it. It right. matters to me whether it's irrational as a belief system. It matters to me whether uh, it's, con it's incompatible with certain well-attested beliefs that say scientists uh, uh, propose for us, right? So I think um, in that sense, um, sort of defining religion, basically what I would say is I, I think um, that it's kind of prejudicial maybe uh, yeah. because many practitioners of these religions would say, no, it is uh, based on reason too. Right. Um, and yeah, so now maybe what you're pointing to, Anton, maybe you could clarify this. Maybe what you're pointing to is you're saying, look, but isn't faith going in some sense beyond evidence? And so here we're kind of coming to a particular issue here. Like, is, isn't faith something that just isn't a matter purely of calculating probabilities, right? Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which you go beyond. And the answer is absolutely, but it's, it could be a reasonable step mm. of faith. Mm. But there is nothing inherent in principle in the idea of that trust or venturing into the unknown or committing yourself existentially to a particular course of action yeah. that requires that it be blind, irrational, against evidence, and so on. Hmm. So certainly religious belief involves way more than arguments and reasoning, way more than found uh, like grounds for that belief, way more than evidence, but way more might be in evidence. And I guess my on that. Right. Uh, I think yeah, so um, I guess what I was referring to yeah. is that, of course, there are people with inquisitive minds who need rational justification for their right. uh, religious beliefs. But I guess what I wanted to point out is that there are always some people, uh, I mean, who are less inquisitive about their beliefs simply. And yeah. you may take it sufficient uh, to just express their sort of blind faith in something and that will be sufficient for them to have a religious view and not having a need to sort of justify it. And we'll admit that mm. they do have a religious view in that case. I guess that relates to some right. of the religious epistemology and some of the other issues we, we're going yeah. to talk about. But what, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's excellent. And we will dedicate, I hope, an entire episode to this because this is fascinating. Let me just draw some distinctions that I think will be helpful to answer this question. When we're talking about warrant for a belief, or when we're talking about justification 
I think it can come in different forms, um, depending again on a particular belief in question. So let me let me let me give you an example. Um, if I if you ask me what 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 did I have uh, for breakfast, uh, I could say well omelet. Um, no, in fact I didn't because I'm a vegan. But uh, I could say um, I had porridge, right? Now, why, why do I say that? Or, or what's the justification for me, for my belief that I had that? Well, it would be, say, my immediate, sort of my memory, right? I, I, I remember eating it. Notice, though, that here, interestingly, it's a kind of a, the evidence in question is kind of private. Like, you can't access that <laughs> justification, right? You can't access that warrant for that belief. Um, you can believe that on the basis of my testimony about what I had for breakfast. And that would be your grounds for believing what Dima had for breakfast. Right. Different from Dima's own grounds for believing that. It's kind of direct memory-based belief. Mm -hmm. Or right now we're seeing each other and you're, you are spontaneously forming a belief that Dima is talking to me. You're not forming that belief on the basis of other beliefs that you hold are propositions that you take to be true. And then you sort of go mentally and infer from them that the likeliest explanation is that indeed Dima is speaking to me. That belief is formed kind of spontaneously, right? Now, so what I think often happens is that when you ask a religious person, why do you believe what you believe? And they answer, and again, I'm mainly speaking about my Christian community and the answer is something like, well, I am at God or, I know Jesus. They're not saying there is absolutely no evidence in whatever form for what I am saying. It's a, it's a pure jump in the unknown without any reason. Right. What they are saying is that there's some kind of experience I have under, undergone. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that experience, uh, that's what I believe. It seems evident to me. And when they do these moves of like, it seems evident to me, I think in, in, if we're as, uh, let's say, um, if we are, um, at, if we're not going to be too prejudicious at this point and given the, be the benefit of the doubt, I think what they're saying is something like, uh, God is, I'm, I'm experiencing God or mm -hmm. that's part of my world, my life. And in that sense, right. they're offering kind of experience based justification without maybe being able to articulate it because they're yeah. not philosophers. Uh, but that's what they're doing. Now, if you ask me, for justifying my belief, I think that it's kind of, I, I could offer a sort of dual warrant or justification to mm. it. I could also point to experience of God in my own life. Yeah. That perhaps is all, let's just say, perhaps that war, that ground is sufficient for my knowing that there is a God. Mm. And yet it will not be sufficient for me to convince you of that and it shouldn't be convincing there yeah. are all sorts of people having all sorts of experiences yeah. uh, and in other words just like we noted that difference between publicly available evidence and private evidence of sorts in the form of memory or in the form of perception that experience that that provides a foundation for yeah. your yeah. belief um, so that's one form of warrant i can also access right but as a philosopher, that's not the, you know, the only one. I think that, and even think of it this way, even like as a philosopher, I'm constantly, I, I, I read literature from an opposing point of view and my atheist friends and uh, the atheist philosophers that I read would, would challenge my, my belief, right? In God on the basis of that experience. So they would say, well, what about this consideration? What about that? And those considerations we can call kind of defeaters to my, or potential defeaters to my belief that they have the power to actually undermine right. my belief in some way. Yeah. And maybe at some point I will have to um, respond in kind. I'd have to construct arguments. I would have to engage in, uh, in a sort of a back and forth. Mm. Well, here mm. are my public, here's a, here's a way for me to justify it, not just by appeal to this bare experience, but mm. in a way that should like could be convincing to more than one person, yeah. given that there are all sorts of claims to uh, the reality of this and that. Uh, yeah. 
by people from different religious traditions. Yeah. So at this point, evidence straightforwardly comes in. And yeah, it, yeah I've said a lot. Is, is <laughs> no, 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 that's great. That's great. I just wanted to sum that up briefly. So mm -hmm. my question to you was that whether yes. sort of blind faith, uh, which is not necessarily uh, uh, supported by, by, by some kind of foreign can be a feature of religion. And in response, you said that, you know, many times people who have a religious belief, it may appear that they have some kind of a blind mm. faith, but in reality, they would have some warrant. It may not be yeah. some kind of warrant that they have for their other beliefs. Sometimes they may have this kind of personal experience argument for yeah. what they believe, yeah. such as I've experienced God, etc. cetera. And right. it right. was very useful that you brought the example of what you had for breakfast today, because there's clearly a distinction uh, between yeah. that belief and a religious belief. So maybe a few, yes. two points that, that I wanted to make. So the first one about the religious belief based on experience. And you said that, well, someone who said that they have experienced God, um, basically for me to believe them, I would be relying on their testimony, just as I would be relying on your testimony for the fact that it's yeah. breakfast. And yes. obviously someone would come back to you and say, well, they, they probably have more reason to believe what you have for breakfast because they don't, they, 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 they don't need have a reason to, um, uh, to suspect that you lie into them and yes, importantly yes. they don't believe that you're delusional or you have any hallucinations about what you might have had for breakfast and perhaps most importantly is because they've also had the similar experience of having breakfast and they <laughs> eat breakfast for porridge so they sort of kind of can relate to that whereas uh, in contrast to that when someone comes to them and say that you know they saw Jesus this morning yeah they find it harder to believe to that so there's sort of um a higher expectation uh -huh. what else right, the, right. The, the person can offer as an evidence well that's sort of one point that that makes this belief at least in many people's eyes to be yeah. based on blind faith and the second point i guess that i wanted to make or if you if you yeah. want to could i just step in yeah. at this point okay. let's just make a distinction between a definition of faith and the verdict over a particular believing or Toxastic attitude or um, a particular act of believing or trusting, right? In other words, we could say um, it's, prejudicial, it's prejudicial to define faith as already just blind. Yeah. But uh, we, we shouldn't do that. Rather, let's define it as, I don't know, trust, um, committing oneself towards a particular entity that one thinks exists or committing oneself to a particular way of life. Mm -hmm. um, that often is existentially significant, right? Um, and, and then, but then it can turn out that what people think are good reasons, mm -hmm. let's say, in the form of their religious experience, might upon analysis turn out to be not good reasons. Why? Because there are defeaters for that, right? Mm -hmm. But you see, I, I think there, there is a difference between sort of defining faith as irrational or blind immediately as opposed to just saying, well, let's hold on about that. Right. It seems like the practitioners at least think they're not irrational. The practitioners define themselves and think that, they, that faith does not mean that, but in fact, it means, you know, um, let's say having an experience of God, uh, that that's their foundation. Uh, and, and so it's a further question whether there are defeaters for that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, we definitely will talk about that. Uh, whether yeah. there are defeaters for that yeah. and, and your example, whether your example, let's say, suffices for a defeater and so on. We, we can talk about that. Yeah, and, and here I think a lot uh, in, in the way we, how we define religion, a lot depends on what kind of practitioners we come across because there are various ways to practice religion, right? And so we can have individual definitions of these various ways of practice. So for instance, your example was of those believers who have some personal experience of God and yeah. can rely on that evidence to substantiate their belief. Whereas, can I just say, not, not consciously necessarily, right? It's a kind right. of a spontaneous thing. Uh, right. They, they, they right. may not be able to articulate it well, exactly. but I, I think that's what, in fact, they're doing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, in, in sort of my experience of interaction with people, uh, with religious people, yeah. that I, I haven't heard them bring that much sort of reference to personal experiences. So many of the believers that I've come across 
when you ask them about the reasons for their faith, they would simply refer to a scripture, a particular book they read, a yeah. conversation they have with someone, something they want in their church. Um, and when you sort of try to dig a little deeper and start to ask them questions that might not have answers to, uh, they sort of back up and say, well, you, you know, you're not allowed to question that. This you have right. to just believe. And right. I'm not saying that that's the oh, attitude right. of, of, of most, uh, most religious people, but at least a, a, a good, good many of them. And so this yeah. is probably where this definition of religion comes from, just from this uh, group of practitioners that perhaps are not too thorough in their religious oh, beliefs. Yes, yes, certainly. And I think, I think in a way, such thing exists for any community. It, yeah. it often has all sorts of members. Uh, some are more educated than others. Some have looked into reasons why their community does what, they, what it does, right? But yeah. what you're pointing to essentially when, when, when people bring up scripture, it's often, they, they basically say, look, I, I take it on, on the testimony of others that, that um, God exists and so on. So they are in that sense relying on authorities. Yeah. Uh, for their belief formation. And I do want to say that in principle, there's nothing unique about religion there. Um, exactly, you yeah. and I rely on authorities because we have to. We cannot yeah. for ourselves investigate every single important fact. We, we would die if, 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 if kids adopted a kind of thoroughgoing skepticism with respect to everything th yeah. that whoever is in authority yeah. is telling them and even adults when they when they read what scientists tell them or what they, when they read what um i don't know um their loved ones or relatives tell them about their life and so on like to some extent many like i think the vast majority of our beliefs actually if you come to think of it is based actually on testimony oh, and the issue is yeah the issue is i guess um are we rational in, in, in doing so? And definitely it seems to me that kind of a wholesale dismissal of testimony and trust in authority, well, it really depends on what kind of authority and the whole wholesale dismissal of that as a proper belief forming practice mm -hmm. in principle before investigating it in its details, I yeah. think is, is, is not right. Um, yeah. We should yeah. kind of say, well, yeah, it looks like a testimony-based belief. Well, let's let's look look at the details, and maybe when we do yeah. so, yeah. it's not going to be rational. No, that's very good. And I think what we're trying to say here is that some of the, you know, in some respect, the religious belief can be similar to belief in some scientific truths, for example, that are held by the larger community. So oh. if you're trying to challenge people and ask them to explain why they believe that yeah. forced gravity exists or uh, in the truth of that theory, <laughs> exactly. instance, they would just yeah. refer you to some authorities and, and we can say that, well, perhaps, uh, perhaps we should question their beliefs to the same extent we like to question people's religious beliefs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and that refers to, I guess, one specific topic that we'll talk later on when we talk about sort of extrinsic um, uh, components of, of our beliefs. Uh, that's something to cover later, but we need to move on here. We yes. looks like we spent a lot of time on the on the definition. I of, love it. <laughs> is there something else we need to say before on definition of religion before we move on to other concepts? I think it's good to move on. I'm sure yeah. we can come back to the topics we covered. If, yeah. if, so I hope all listeners now have a, a, a fairly good grasp <laughs> of what religion is. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about. Shall we start with theism then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what's theism? Right. So let me, yeah. So I, I think that, that, right. So I define theism as the proposition that God or gods exist, right? Um, and often it's defined immediately as a belief that God or gods exist. But I think that way uh, makes it a, a, bit, a, a bit confusing, for example, when we want to say, look, I believe that theism is true. Mm -hmm. And we usually say something is true, what we mean is that, you know, a proposition or a sentence expressing uh, a proposition is true. Um, and, and belief as a psychological state is not the sort of thing that is capable of being true or false. As in terms of the believing act itself, not the content of the belief, of course, can be. Right? Right. But the, 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 the actual believings Mm -hmm. uh, just aren't the sort of things that carry truth or are, are um, in and of themselves as, let's say, mental acts. Uh, 
representational in nature or capable of representing the world as say we believe propositions and sentences are capable of doing. So, so I would suggest that I think uh, honoring the practice of basically saying um, theism is false or true, um, or there are reasons to think it is, um, we should define it as a proposition that God or gods uh, exist. But if we do so, I think that it's natural to define atheism uh, also as, as the proposition, which basically would be a kind of negation of theism, right? Um, so it would be the proposition that God or gods do not exist. Um, so now notice that I, I'm kind of using theism more broadly than perhaps uh, many today would in the Western sort of in our part of the world, yeah. because it's the the god or gods the the or gods may not yeah. be as relevant any longer. Are we talking of Zeus here? Or yeah, exactly. Are we talking about some old pantheon of gods? Yeah, right. and and what I would say there is that's right. We could say for our purposes say that theism is uh, the proposition that God exists, and mm -hmm. then of course it, I need to define God. What I mean by God, uh, and then atheism would be uh, the denial yeah. of that. It would be the proposition that. God, as defined, yeah. does not exist. And but so, that would be, in a way, sorry, if I, if I just said, that would basically be a kind of a, a narrower use of the term because we have other terms like polytheism, pantheism, okay. panentheism, um, that, that are treated often as a variety of theism. Mm -hmm. And what the re that's why I adopted a broader uh, definition that mm -hmm. it's the proposition that God or gods exist because then we can kind of bring in those as um, mm -hmm. as uh, particular varieties of theism. Yeah, yeah. And just to connect this back to our discussion of what religion is, so mm -hmm. when we talk about religion, where we said that, for instance, um, you know, Buddhism would be a counterexample to some of the definition of religion because there is no concept of deity on, in, in Buddhism. Yeah. Right? This is not as central. So right. where does, uh, where does uh, Buddhism stand in terms of like theism and atheism distinction? Yeah. Can yeah. we say yeah. that someone who is a Buddhist is a theist or would that be? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's good. So a couple of, a couple of things there. Um, it's not quite right to say uh, that all forms of Buddhism right. um, lack any kind of belief in uh, the existence of gods. It's not, it's not right. But, Many, but there are varieties of Buddhism traditionally yeah. that do lack that uh, belief, and that's all you know. And and they're big enough <laughs> for us to to say that yeah, Buddhism it would be a uh, it would be disqualified mm -hmm. uh, under uh, that kind of one feature approach to defining religion, right? That that it has to involve supernatural entities and and so on. Now, but maybe now to answer your question directly, it's helpful to then bring in some other concepts. For instance, that we have a concept of of, a, of somebody's being non-theist. Right. And that would be somebody who, who lacks theism, somebody who lacks the belief that um, there are gods or God, right? So that person... Uh, now, that is a broad category. Non-theism is basically whoever is not a theist. That's what it means. Yeah. And so it includes a lot of people. For example, it includes what, what people I would call, let's say, innocents, those that have never considered yeah. the proposition, God exists. Um, and like yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many <laughs> such, right? And so, but they would be still non-theists. Right. And so your question, I guess, then could be, is it part of Buddhism to take a stand with respect to the existence or non-existence of God? And yeah. I would, again, I'm not an expert in Buddhism by any stretch of the imagination, but I would say from the little that I know, it's just not part of the focus. And so in a way, uh, even those forms of Buddhism that just do not have the belief in God as part of their teaching, um, they would just be non-theists then. It would just not be relevant, I guess. It would just not be something they necessarily even have entertained and taken a stand on. Right. And, and, and they're per perfectly fine Buddhists, you know, yeah. with all that. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, philosophically minded Buddhists who interact with other religious traditions would defend atheism. They, they, they could bring up similar arguments that, mm. that uh, your Western atheist would, right? To argue against a particular conception of gods being instantiated in reality. Yeah. So 
so yeah, uh, I think it, it, it's an open question, right? <laughs> How yeah, yeah. particular Buddhist um, but, stance but in relation to atheism. Yeah. yeah, well, that's good because that brings us to, you know, considering some other values um, out there because you mentioned that someone who is a Buddhist may just take the issue of God's existence to be irrelevant in a sense and never ask that question in, in the first place. Yeah. So what would you call someone who thinks, you know, who's never considered the question or when presented with the question believes that it's not worth considering that question and thinks oh, it's relevant? Right. Yes. So let's bring up, bring in two more concepts, right? Yeah. That uh, I think are useful. One is uh, agnosticism, right? right? So an agnostic is somebody who, and this is, this is how I understand it, right? Um, an agnostic is somebody who actually has looked at the case in question, has entertained the idea, but ended up sort of suspending his belief in either the proposition of theism or the proposition of atheism. So it's someone who, um, who neither believes that there are gods uh, nor uh, disbelieves in them. Um, and they might think that but, but I will just want to insist that agnosticism traditionally is, a, is an intellectual position. In other words, it already assumes some engagement. So Huxley, I, I believe, was uh, the, one, the, the person that coined that, that term, and he definitely uh, sort of interacted with, with the evidence or uh, purported evidence, and he concluded that um, it's not clear. Uh, it's either undecidable or at least at present he cannot decide. Mm -hmm. That's why he calls himself agnostic. He doesn't know in that sense. Um, now, but your example had to do with someone who lacks a belief in God. He would be a non-theist, right? But he would think that the entire question is moot. It's like, mm -hmm. he doesn't care. And there is a term for that. Apatheism would be a term for that. Oh, Apathy. Sure. In re with respect to theism, that yeah. would be a term that that I would use to describe somebody like that. Yeah, so that would cover someone who, for instance, thinks that nothing really turns on the question whether God yeah. does or doesn't exist, and for that reason, he doesn't just want to spend the any intellectual energy thinking about the matter. So he's sort yeah. of apathetic, yeah. About it, right? Yeah, and and honestly, like, not because I'm a religious person. Yeah. I never understood this attitude. Like, it's fine in the details, like to, to really question, well, maybe morality can survive without God. Of course, uh, this is a legit um, line of reasoning. But to really have kind of a global epitheism, to think that it's irrelevant whether, let's say, the God is traditionally conceived in the West exists or not. Just think of the thought, right? Um, if God exists, let's say if Christianity is true, there is an afterlife. Yeah. Shouldn't at least your self-interest motivate you to find out? Like, it, isn't that at least worthy uh, of your self-interested concern to know whether you'll survive your own death? So that's just like an immediate, um, yeah. let's say, addition you'd have to bring to your view right. of the world, right? If, if, yeah. if God, as traditionally understood, right, by Christians exists, then you would have that. So, so there are all sorts of, I think, features that addition of God to your ontology uh, brings or you would have to modify a number of things, um, yeah. I think. But it's an open question, which things? And so um, I think all can kind of hopefully <laughs> agree that it's not just adding a, a, a bit of new atom, you know, adding a new atom to, to the universe, right? It's, it's yeah. more fundamental than that. Which perhaps leads us to defining God, what we mean by God. Yeah, yeah. Before, using we, move to, we, before yeah. we move yeah, on to defining God, I just wanted to, to, I guess, mention the other issue we'll yeah. discuss later on, which is um, a, the gap issue. And what we're right. talking to think about that, because you just mentioned afterlife, right? And that's, yeah. that's a big part of the Christian belief that there is an afterlife, right? Yeah. But the belief in God himself does not need to commit you to also believe in afterlife. Correct. But, Perhaps someone yeah. who's you know apathetic about God's existence, he has not even entertained that thought about the afterlife because he thinks, well, even if you prove that God exists, there's just too far a stretch to say that there's also <laughs> some kind of afterlife because what kind of evidence do you need for that? So yeah. that would be motivation for some people to not think about God. Yeah. So so this would be you know perhaps somebody who's just considering bare philosophical theism. Yeah. Or deism. That's another important 
kind of uh, view the, the proposition that you know uh, God God exists all right, but he doesn't really care <laughs> uh, yeah. about what's going on, what you do in your free time, you know, and so you shouldn't bother either. So that that's you know that's one view. Um, I guess what I would say is at least let's agree on this um, that. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm imagining I'm speaking to an apatheist. Ep uh, I could say, well, let's just agree on this. If Christianity is true uh, and the God that it defines exists, which would also mean that certain additional claims about him obtain, hmm. it seems irrational to say anyone shouldn't care about whether or not such a God exists. Now, you might have a very quick way to dismiss that possibility in a way of like, you know, let's say you have a particular standard of talking about these things that quickly gets you to a dismissal. Mm -hmm. But to insist that it wouldn't matter if you're wrong, that's a different claim, right? To insist that even if he existed, things would just go as normal. Yeah. That I believe would be to misunderstand the claim in question. At least with, uh, let, let's just say, at least with respect to great monotheists, it would be to misunderstand the question, mm -hmm. um, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, but even with philosophical deism, if you're curious enough, uh, mm -hmm. sh shouldn't you sort of wonder, all right, maybe he do God doesn't care about what I do and there is no afterlife, but heck, this is a special kind of entity. Um, should I perhaps ground certain things in that entity, right? Yeah. Perhaps it can have some theoretical uh, benefit to it, right? Perhaps I could use that hypothesis yeah. in certain areas in thinking about the world. And that's fine, even if sort of afterlife is out of the picture and these other things are out of the picture. Mm, yeah, no, that's right. I, I guess my point was just to point out this, this gap issue between the claim that God exists yes. and the traditional yes. claims that comes as sort of traditional baggage with, with Christianity and some other religions. Yeah. And, and the point that for someone who's really apathetic about God, what would would take for us to distantly interest that person in God's existence would be yeah. to also interest in these additional claims like, you know, afterlife and the God is good and that God cares for your existence and, yeah. you know, things exactly. like that. Exactly. So perhaps this is where maybe this would be helpful. The way I'm using the term God mm. is that I'm, I'm defining God as a necessarily existent personal being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and all good. So already in the definition of God, I'm saying he is all good, right? Or right. he is all good, right? And with this, we um, move to the, to the question of definition of God, right? Right. And my point about apatheism, what seems irrational to me, is that you wouldn't care, or you, don't, you wouldn't believe that, uh, that anything hangs on whether that God, that yeah. conception of God, if it's instantiated, has mm -hmm. any import for yeah. for your life yeah. that seems to me to be uh irrational yeah so to come back to the definition of god that you've just given yes um, yes if you could repeat that once again yes just, yes just, of course sorry that because there's a lot of uh, a lot yeah. of stuff there to discuss so and we might dedicate an entire um okay. entire episode for that but god is a necessarily existent being personal being who what is, do you mean by personal yeah. here yeah, so uh, before I say anything about that, let me just say there is an entire subfield in philosophy of religion having to do with coherence of theism. Yeah. So it raises all sorts of puzzles about uh, attributes of God that have been traditionally ascribed to God. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many puzzles in relation to each of them, right? That That's why I, I said we might need a, an additional episode. But briefly, um, personal means that uh, not to beg the question against um, people like myself who, be who believes in particular doctrines like tr the Trinity. Um, I, will, I will not say that personal just means God is a person. Um, but I would say that there are features that we usually um, associate with personhood that uh, theists believe apply to God. For example, um, ability to make decisions. Hmm. For example, to relate in an interpersonal way, right? By loving or responding. Uh, 
Um, now, <laughs> things get complicated. Not all theists agree at this point. Some conceive of God as utterly unaffectable, you could say, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a, not even a being, as the being itself. Um, it's the ground of all reality. He is undifferentiated actuality. Uh, and again, we, we would need to sort of unpack that. complex world out there. We'll probably spell them out later on. But yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, they, they don't conceive of God in personalistic terms, or they don't mm. think of God as in a univocal sense, in the same sen sense in which you and I are persons, that God just is that. Yeah. But they might still speak in analogical terms and say, God is something like us. Mm. And then you would point, what are those features? Well, mm. whatever features, uh, well, many features could be pointed to, like uh, capacity for thought, capacity, again, for action, capacity for um, mm. experience of some sort, right? Mm. But again, everything I'm saying is super contested. So there right. are disagreements right. inside of the camp right. about every point I'm making. But so would it be fair to say that when you say that, that God is a personal being, uh, yeah. part of that understanding is that it's somewhat like people in a way, just like... Yeah, person, yeah, like, right, yeah. So. And so some philosophers yeah. like Richard Swinburne, Alvin Plantinga, they would just go ahead and define God as a person, like yeah. or an, okay. a, an unembodied mind, right? right. It's just okay. that I think that might be a bit problematic on... Trinitarian understanding. So, so defining God as a person yeah. might be problematic. Now, we might talk about my views on the Trinity later because uh, I don't think it in fact is problematic, Yeah, but it could be. So I, I don't want to now sort of misrepresent the camp. Uh, okay. So that's why I'm making these qualifications as I'm going. Try to okay. be as broad as possible. I mean, possible. Not, not to get too bogged down on, on yeah. the Trinity yeah. now. So, uh, so we've defined God as a necessary, necessarily existent yeah. uh, personal being that is also, what are the additional? Omn omnipotent. Omnipotent. That would be all-powerful, right? All -powerful. Uh, There's nothing that he or she can do or oh, we don't gosh, know if God is he or she. The or, definition of omnipotence requires an episode of its own because yeah. there are puzzles in relation to that could god create a stone to have it for him to lift um are there things that god cannot do and is that consistent with being all powerful what do you mean precisely as all powerful right. very very few theists actually endorse the idea that god could bring about the logically impossible like mm -hmm. and and so but but some might want to say no 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 that that already modifies too much uh, your mm. your claim that god is omnipotent we can talk about that i, okay. I don't think it does but we can talk about that um, okay. now another attribute is that god is all-knowing right uh, yeah, that is to say that is the word omni omniscient right omniscient. that he knows all true prop propositions right and does not believe any false propositions mm -hmm. and again it usually is limited to propositional knowledge right mm -hmm. so often when we think about knowledge we can recognize uh different I guess, kinds of knowledge, right? So we could say propositional knowledge is knowledge that, knowledge of facts. Mm -hmm. But you could also have a kind of, um, you know, you can have knowledge by acquaintance, having yeah. an experience of something or know-how, like, which might not be reducible to a set of sentences or propositions. Right. So for example, it might be the case that only you, Anton, know what it's like to be you in a right. kind of experiential way. And the claim that God is all-knowing traditionally would not encompass that uh, knowledge yeah. because that would be to, to require that God be you, which is a contradiction. Right. So instead it would be limited to propositional knowledge, yeah. knowledge of facts that is something that um, yeah. an omniscient being would know. Or how about knowledge how, for instance, can we say that you know, the yeah. uh, God is omniscient so he knows who the next champion of the Wimbledon is gonna be, but he doesn't know how to play tennis? Yes in the experiential sense, which requires you, for example, if, if we're gonna define knowing how to play tennis by saying that you have, all, in the definition is the thought, in the definition is the commitment that you're embodied, that you have a body, right? right. That, that, that you can move limbs and that you it's have a muscle kind of memory. body muscle memory yeah. uh, with respect to your movements, then no, God does not. Hmm. The question then I guess becomes, 
is that a limitation on God? And this is where theists would say, doesn't, doesn't seem like it is, right? Maybe being mm -hmm. embodied just isn't something that the greatest conceivable being must be. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that would be kind of a response. But, you're, but technically, it's really the propositional knowledge that right. theists ascribe to God and say okay. that he knows that maximally. And finally, okay. there is all goodness of God. Yeah, well, so let's talk about yeah. that. So what's all goodness? Yeah. What do we mean when, when, when yeah. we say God is all good? Yeah, all good or sometimes uh, omnibenevolent or all loving. Um, yeah, so let's, let's just say something like this. And again, super contested area. To love someone is at least to do this. It's to seek the well-being of the beloved, mm -hmm. to desire the beloved's well-being, to seek that the object of your love is flourishing, to seek that flourishing for the one you love. Right. And secondly, that you seek appropriate union with the beloved. So that's the kind of definition of, of love that, I, that I, I, I like. So it's seeking some kind of union. Because you can imagine somebody being quite, somebody who does not want in any way to relate to someone, you know, like, like professionals who, who help other human beings in a kind of disinterested way, that they, they do that. They don't want to have any relationship with that, with that being. I think when we think about God and his relation to the world, it would be a kind of loving relation to the world. Um, in, in, in one book, for example, in the book of Job, at the mm -hmm. end, God describes his relationship in a very motherly way, kind of tender way that he, he relates to every creature in that way. And so there is a kind of total all encompass. Say it again? Sorry, is that after he brings all that misery to Job and destroys his house and kills his sons, he says that he's very <laughs> intimately related to him? <laughs> I think, I think, my man, and I, I've, I've studied the book a lot, and we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Because that's something that that that's something I do. Um, I, I think that's a misunderstanding of what's going on. It's okay. a, it's a, it's yeah. Uh, we can talk about that. I don't yeah, think yeah, it's actually historically. It's claiming to be uh, a history of what happened. Hmm. Rather, it's a philosophical, ancient philosophical treatment of problems of faithfulness, righteousness, why do righteous suffer, right. and what's the right approach in that situation? Right. Is, it, is it cursing God? Is it defying life itself? Mm -hmm. Or is it finding meaning, endurance, and seeking justice? So that's yeah. how I would see yeah. it. Yeah. But I mean, to, to come back to the, to the goodness of that, so you yeah. connected goodness to sort of the intimate relation that God has to people caring yes. for their well-being so cares for their well-being and seeks appropriate union so let's think of a an in, what an inappropriate union might be hmm. I have two children and hmm. it would be an inappropriate union with them if I hmm. sought sexual union with them right hmm. but that's not the case for my wife uh, my loving her involves seeking that hmm. and it's proper and wonderful so in that sense, it allows God's love to manifest itself in all sorts of ways, just like our love manifests itself in all sorts of ways, yeah. depending on who it is that we love. Hmm. And uh, your, your, your love for a dog <laughs> should look different from your love to your mother and so on. And so in that sense, there is a kind of um, variety, but there is a unifying principle there of seeking hmm. the well-being on the one hand, and seeking some union, some sense of togetherness in it, and not just a disinterested, I will help you, and then bye, I don't want to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's affirmed of God, uh, that he is maximally that, mm -hmm. which, uh, by the way, ties immediately to the one objection, uh, which we might discuss, but it comes after the problem of suffering. And some see it as a, vari as a variant of the problem of suffering, which is the problem of divine hiddenness. God seems hidden. God seems disinterested mm. to honest seekers of him. Like, why is it that somebody sort of wants that relationship and it, it looks like God just doesn't care? Like he yeah. is not yeah. granting them that there and then. Yeah. And it's like, um, is, is that a problem for his yeah. all lovingness? Well, sorry to rush because we'll have yes. to move on uh, to the next right. issue before we run up, wrap up because we also have to discuss the burden of proof. But so far, yes. so we've, we've, we've covered these different attributes that, that God ought to have. So I guess two questions remains in this connection. So the first is that all these attributes that we named, would they be sort of the universal 
definition of God that would be characteristic of most forms of theism or at least of the monotheistic religions or is that only characteristic of Christianity? Yeah, I think that it would be fair to say that they would definitely cover the great monotheists, uh, mm -hmm. monotheistic traditions. So they would cover Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. All claim that mm -hmm. about the God they believe in, mm -hmm. but it certainly does not, <laughs> it would not extend to many other, like it wouldn't extend to, extend to polytheism, obviously. Right. Just just focus on even one one aspect there of necessarily existent, right? Mm -hmm. That makes God pretty foundational and ultimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your your typical Zeus character um, mm -hmm. just isn't claimed to be that. He he certainly has lots of impact in 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 the mythology, um, but he is not he is not the ground of all reality outside of himself, as God is claimed to be. He is not the ground of all being. Um, yeah. So he's not God with that sense of a capital G God. He's a deity, but he isn't necessarily the creator God of monotheistic mm -hmm. uh, faith. Yeah. Yeah. I see. And so I guess my second question before we move on to the burden of proof and the arguments for God's existence yes. is that, so we've named all these attributes that a God has, at least in the major monotheistic yeah. religions. And so, when we offer the arguments for God's existence, yes. does this mean that we need to have, we need to be able to prove that all of these attributes are true of the building, of, of the right. entity whose existence we're trying to prove? That's exactly what, what we are planning to discuss. Right. Um, do you, would you like me to just to give a very brief response? Because it will be inadequate. It needs a lot of groundwork and laying down how exactly I see the threats coming together. Yeah. The goal is that to, to vindicate that conception. But whether or not that's achieved, and obviously we will see, but uh, it requires a particular view on how these arguments work yeah. that I would like to discuss maybe separately. Or do you want me to say something generally about it now? I mean, I guess we'll, we'll have time to come back to that because we'll, we'll still have okay. to cover the issue of burden of, of proof. proof. Yeah. <laughs> but perhaps one mm -hmm. sort of clarification that will be useful. So yeah. we do need to prove that all of these attributes um, yes. are true, does that mean that if, you, if we're not able to prove one of them, then sort of the argument fails and oh, we, we're not able yeah. to vindicate the existence of God the way we yeah. understand it? I, I think that, uh, let's just say like this, if, if it, so I would, I would say that no single argument with an exception of maybe the ontological argument mm -hmm. gets you all the way, mm -hmm. if it's successful. Uh, I think it's a cumulative approach where you're trying to build a picture here. Mm -hmm. In the process, you might, to your own satisfaction, show that atheism is not true. Some deity, some supernatural reality uh, exists. Mm -hmm. But it, you're right. You might not be able to bridge it perfectly to that concept, to the conception that I am, that I am proposing. Um, and so... Either more arguments are needed, or at least you might motivate a sort of real openness to a religious experience that might get you further. And the further there would be more in a form of, yes, trust. Mm. Uh, not that the experience itself has that content. No, usually it doesn't. Even if in the experience, the, 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 the God that you're experiencing would tell you, I am all loving, all that, that wouldn't come. It would just still be a kind of a, testimony uh, of sorts, but you could, let's say, have good reasons to think a particular religion is true, and that religion uses the concept of God in this way. Yeah. And so you would sort of, you would, then, you would then say, look, this evidence that sort of pointed in this direction, but didn't decisively single out that God, given, let's say, this experience I'm having, or, or, or given reasons to think that this religion got it right, maybe I could just sort of follow that uh, and, and just sort of say, yes, in fact, God is, uh, is what satisfies the activity of whatever first cause we, we discover through argumentation or uh, the, um, the moral ground or what have you. Yeah. God would then be a kind of unifying hypothesis for all of those different threads, hmm. right? Hmm. But you're exactly right. Like, uh, especially any single argument, 
is not going to get you all the way, except maybe for the ontological. <clears throat> and honestly, it's never claimed to be that. Or at least, let, let me put it this way. The ancients did claim that. At least I'm not prepared to claim that. I think that the right approach is to say, no, it, it, they're modest. They yeah. get you to some kind of generic theism where you begin to take seriously the idea mm -hmm. of God. And, and then additional uh, argumentation lines are needed. Yeah. 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 That, that's very helpful. So, I yeah. mean, let's move on to the last thing we're going to discuss today. Right. And, and that's going to be the burden of proof. Right. So for, for some of our listeners, I guess the term is going to be familiar, especially for those who are lawyers. So <laughs> something like, you know, if you bring something up, if you make an assertion, you better have the evidence to prove that. Yes. And so in the context of philosophy of religion, it could be interpreted like that. If, if, if you come up to me and say that God exists, well, it's your job to prove it. Yeah. It's not my job to prove that God doesn't exist. You come and try to uh, right. prove it to me. Is that a right way to understand the... Uh, yeah, the I think actually in, in this example, that's right. So suppose somebody comes to you, you never made any, any, any claims of your own, and somebody uh, asserts that God exists. If they're not just expressing <laughs> the things that they believe in a kind of, you're just there almost accidentally, you just happen to listen in, but they want to tell you something. They, wanna, they want you to take what they're saying with some seriousness. Well, then I think they, sh they bear the burden of proof. I think theists bear the burden of proof in conversations like that, absolutely. Any claim, I think in that kind of dialogue that a person makes, a, a knowledge claim of some sort, uh, must have some kind of justification for it. Again, it may not necessarily be at the end of the day in the form of publicly available evidence, but there has to be some justification uh, for what you believe. Um, now, and especially the claims you make, rather. Let's focus on that, not just your beliefs, although I would extend it to beliefs as well. But the burden of proof is really the idea of what happens in a, in a, in a, in a dialectical context. Two or more people meet together, they have exchanges. Who has to justify whose claims is the question. And I think it's the right view to hold that those who make positive claims must justify them in that dialectical context. But then notice that on my definition of atheism, atheism is the proposition that God does not exist. So if somebody says, I'm an atheist, right? They're saying essentially that, um, that uh, or as far as uh, on that definition, they're saying uh, there are no gods. And anyone saying that, right, needs to back it up, I think. Because the default position in my view is not atheism. Um, so I think, uh, Anthony Flew, famous uh, atheist from the 20th century, who talked about kind of the, the, the default is atheism. I think that's, that's wrong. I think the default is agnosticism. Some kind of agnosticism, I think, is, is the non-question begging default view where, look, I'm not committing myself either way. Why do I need to explain further? But let me just say one thing about that, though. There might still be a burden of proof that even an agnostic has to bear especially of the intellectual, so, intellectual sort. So for example, if somebody says, it's indeterminate whether there is a God or not, mm. he needs to back that up because it is a positive claim of sorts. It's a claim about evidence. It's a claim about parity or the nature of evidence at hand that mm. is somehow lacking, which leads them not to commit themselves either way. That might still need justification if the person asserts that in a conversation, right? Um, with an interlocutor. Um, so that's what I guess I would say. And maybe at this point, it's like, I, I qualified what I said about atheists by saying on, on the definition I proposed, this is where I think it's fascinating to ask, well, but should we use the definition? Um, it, because there are people that are using the term atheist differently from the one I, I suggest they should in such conversations. For example, they use it as equivalent for, of, for um, basically somebody is an atheist if he merely lacks the belief in God, period. Right. Mm. He just doesn't believe. In other words, atheism <clears throat> is about their cognitive states, what's lacking there, basically. They don't have a belief mm. in any deity, say. Yeah. And, and so I think that 
there is a game that's often played by such people that they want to play the skeptic, purely the skeptic. They want to just basically stand back, hear the theist attempt to argue for theism, themselves never argue that there are no gods, right? Okay. Call yeah. themselves atheists, but basically only destruct the, the, the defeat the arguments that theist proposes, doing no positive work of their own to justify their position because they kind of hide away in that non-theism camp, mm -hmm. uh, in the camp of, oh, all I, all I am is I'm not a theist. And uh, there are varieties of non-theism where, of course, you can do that. But mm -hmm. atheism, as I define it, is also one variety. And, and there are other kinds of non-theism out there. And yeah. some do need justification, right. uh, especially in that kind of exchange. Right. So I can give you more specific arguments if you want me to for, for the philosophical um, definition that I was using as I think the best for the purposes of seeking truth in a uh, sort of in those sorts of dialectical contexts when, when we exchange ideas. Um, but maybe it's too much for this episode. I don't know. Yeah, we'll probably need to wrap up soon. So um, I guess, I guess maybe at this point it would be useful for us to think um, of our non-theist um, listeners yes. who would want to win uh, an argument with a the theist. Right. And we have some tips for him. I have oh, yeah. a tip uh, and maybe you'll, you'll see if, of where it goes. Uh, so if you are a non-theist, so you, you, yes. when you meet a theist who wants to assert that God exists, well, first thing, don't call yourself an atheist because that commits you to discharging some burden of proof, you know, right. by way of offering some <laughs> arguments yeah. for God's non-existence. Right. So you can say that you're a non-theist. Yes. Um, that would be a more moderate position. Um, in yes. that case, you can just say that, you know, the burden of proof lies on the person who brings up the argument of God's existence. You don't need to say that you are an, an agnostic because that would assume that you've sort of evaluated the evidence from both sides and uh, could not decide for yourself whether you <laughs> you're, you're agree or disagree with God's existence. But if you say you, you're a non-theist, it's okay. Well, a theist can sort of challenge you in this way and say that, you know, uh, it's, it's your duty to sort of, if you're this might be interested in the issue. It's your duty to sort of look at the evidence. Otherwise, you'd be an apathy as someone who is apathetic about the <laughs> issue. But if you're not, it's sort of your duty to sort of, you know, evaluate the facts and either claim that you're an agnostic and are offer an argument for yes. that or claim that you're a theist. But then if you are a very committed um, non-theist uh, who doesn't want to make any further claims, perhaps you can say that you're just a great believer in adversarial system <laughs> And that you not, don't want to take to, 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 to assume the role of a judge in your own case, and you, yeah. you'd have someone else <laughs> assume that role instead. And, and you're just merely a litigant here, and you'll yeah. not make any further claims. Could I just say one thing, though, that usually the self identification, uh, the label non theist, is so broad that almost an immediate question that I would have as a theist, well, what kind of non-theist are you? Are you an atheist? Are you an agnostic, like you were saying? Right. And at this point, I'm going to put a, put a person on the spot because the person could say, look, I've never even considered the question. Yeah. In which case, he would, I would call him an innocent. Like he hasn't yet looked at, at, at yeah. the well, data. Yeah, if the person says something yeah. like, oh, yes, I've considered the question, but I've sort of, you know, discharged the question as it's the, the, the claim is after because, you know, People come to me with all kind of nonsense. Some believe right. Father Christmas, some in Paris. I need to consider all this. Well, then, I, then he made a bunch of claims. Then <laughs> I, he would have to back it up. He would have to back it up the comparison that it's that it's actually legit. Then yeah. he would have to back up that uh, it's it's absurd. Like in other words, the moment you begin to make more particular claims beyond yeah. I'm a non theist, you get into the burden of proof issue, I believe. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think you do? Like if somebody said, I think God is like Santa Claus, it's, it's a mythical creature. I think it's equivalent of, I for mean, example, it's an equivalent of yeah. a claim about the concept of God, a claim about um, the seriousness that we should attribute to such mm -hmm. ideas. This is not a claim you just sort of are born with. This is hopefully a claim that you've arrived at by some reflection. It's an intellectual yeah. position, not just a claim about your psychology, right? Yeah. And so it's at this point, I think, intellectually speaking, uh, 
you do need to do some justifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, I guess someone who wants to 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 compare God to I don't know Father Christmas, Father's <laughs> Flying Spaghetti Monster. I love Father that. Flying Spaghetti Monster. We will yeah. talk about that at some point. They'll say that we'll you know, talk about to, it. to them, the when you introduce the idea of God to them, it just sounds like any other fictional character. Yes. But look, it's some figure that's mentioned yes. in some book, and people talk about it. Right. You know, children seem to believe about it. <laughs> the grown-ups at some point they sort of seem to grow out of that. It's right. in a lot of ways it's similar. Yeah. And if you want to prove that it's not a fictional character, then the burden of proof lies on you to try and you know bring out the arguments just as you would if you were, if you wanted to claim that Harry Potter exists. Yeah. So yeah, and so at this point, uh, right in the dialectic, then the person still I think is committed to the idea that at least he sees enough parallels there. Like he mm -hmm. already thinks that uh, that it's a childish belief to believe in God. Like he already classified believe in God in the category of childish things that you grow out from. I think that, I think as an intellectual position, given that not only children believe in it, that the vast majority of humankind have adopted some form of belief, you know, belief in, 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 in God or, uh, or gods, that the, the, I guess the greatest mind in, in the Western tradition at least, uh, you know, you, you talk about Leibniz, Newton, you, you can name famous scientists. They, they believed in God. So at least you need a more, more, more uh, nuanced claim than just childish belief and comparing it. You need to say something like, now we know better. Here is why now we know better. But that involves them in some evidential, it, it involves them in some uh, argumentation, or at least it should. You can't just, I think, say yeah. that and in any case typically i'm never gonna end the conversation there like unless the person just is not open to any exchange like if somebody said to me uh it's just a santa claus belief i'm like i would i would show are you kidding me really why would you think that and then the person would bring that up and then i would say well i could think of the following uh, reasons to think that god exists and yeah. there aren't comparably good mm -hmm. reasons to believe in santa claus as it yeah. does, say. and it, it would get the conversation going from there Right. Well, I guess, I, I guess, I mean, uh, comparing God to a fictional character is one way to right. approach that. Another way is someone could say that, you know, God is just a social construct. And you've named a few figures yeah. in history of great intellectuals who believed in God, although they were more of a deist or so as they, they believe in this God philosophers, maybe, or maybe some were Christians, for yeah. instance. We can right. say, oh, of course they were, but I mean, <laughs> these, these guys live two three centuries yeah, ago that was like a right. theme now like you know we had churches everywhere but look today like in my street the church has been converted to an apartment building yes. another to a coffee shop no one really seriously believes in gods today so it's like an outdated social construction and of course it just <laughs> proves the fact that it's a social construction well maybe maybe there are people in some um yeah. some countries today that still uh, believe to in god in majority but that's just something that tells us about the stage of the development yes. society yes. so and then they will challenge the theist to sort of disprove that god is just a social yeah. construction rather than you know a fact about the universe i love i love this comment this is this is excellent just two brief points i think that um somebody saying that so first of all, I would want to clarify, if somebody says God is just a social construction, that he actually does take a position that uh, by saying just means he's not actually objectively existing. So it, it is atheism. And so in that case, I want to say, well, all right, let me define God for you. And then why do you think he doesn't exist? Why do you go beyond agnosticism by already saying he's just a mythical character? Mm -hmm. If the person just says he might be a mythical character, that would be more consistent with agnosticism, but a more, the stronger claim that he is, I think gets you to atheism pretty quickly. Just mm. like you could say, he is just a social construction, that usually means he is not objectively mind independently existing in the world. Yeah. Uh, and that does lend you to atheism. But another point uh, you made is, honestly, I would say, this is just an outrageous claim that people today of highest intellectual stature do not believe in God. Uh, there are yes, they might be in the minority, let's say the the, the scientific community. But gosh, um, there are many religious people yeah. that are bona fide, like scientists that are um, philosophers of the highest stature, that yeah. are respected in their discipline. So, in other words, I would just sort of reveal the ignorance of a claim like that 
right. um, if I were interacting with that individual. And, and then again, put it on him to then say, well, let's continue. Let's look at the evidence again. Let's not close your mind because of some popular uh, conception in the post-Christian yeah. world, but let's, yeah. let's be, be open. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, I, I guess we'll have to wrap up soon, but I guess <laughs> on that point. This is so much fun, me, man. Let me, yeah, just let me say that. I guess someone, uh, if, if you brought up the, the example of, of some of the great intellectuals of today who are in the minority, but they still do believe in yeah. God, seriously, and someone could say, well, maybe there's something just psychological about the belief in God. Maybe these people are just scared of like letting go of that belief. Yeah. They, maybe yeah. they have their, you know, hesitations about it, but they just feel so lonely without God because <laughs> belief in God is something that yes. gives you a lot of comfort and support because, you know, religious people would say some things like, you know, God has a plan for your life. God is looking out for yeah. you. You know, God is supporting you. God gives meaning. And yeah. if you yes. give away God, you're going to lose all that and you're going to be just a lonely um, <laughs> and individual yeah, yeah, face yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the absurdity yeah. like the rest of us. So why give up God? So maybe this, you yeah. know, big intellectual stage is a little weak down in, in yeah the they have this uh, this area of irrationality in yeah in, in, they're, they're just these funny creatures that happen to to maintain a, yeah. a belief yeah, in, like in a god I, I think just briefly very briefly i know we need to stop but just to say what i would say is look such judgments and characterizations are empirical claims you're making an empirical claims about actual people in actual disciplines. Mm -hmm. The only way to go about answering whether that hypothesis is correct is, let's say, through sociological studies, through uh, evidence, empirically based evidence. And, and I have looked at studies, or at least I've listened to um, talks about the, the deliverances of these uh, studies about intelligence of, of religious people and mm. their capacity as rational creatures, mm. I don't think there is any kind of consensus in uh, intellectual community that religious people are somewhat deficient or they have these vices um, about them. Now, guys claim, people claim that Richard Dawkins calls belief in God a delusion. Some people call it a virus of the mind. But what is lacking often in those assertions is empirical evidence to back it up. And, and that's where I would want to say, this is not for armchair philosophy, this is social science. Yeah. And let's talk, let's go to empirical evidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think we've, we've, we've said enough on the issue of burden of proof and we, we understand it's a complicated issue, but I mean, let me just say that the burden of proof is gonna be extremely important when we talk about the uh, arguments for and against God's existence. So this is just- And I'm happy to bear it. That's, that's the thing, yeah. I'm happy to. To, to bear it, yeah. yeah. Excellent, so I mean, unless you have any closing thoughts or points that you wanna make on this issue. Uh... Let me just say, I'm so excited about this series. I love that we just went back and forth and I really hope we could continue in this flowing way. I think this would be beneficial for people listening in to sort of see a real live back and forth yeah. exploring ideas. I think it's yeah. just delightful. No, I think it was great, and I hope our listeners enjoyed this as much as we did. Uh, <laughs> let me remind you that we, I mean, we don't have any script for any of these shows, that that's right. why we perhaps went a little bit over time today, <laughs> because we got so excited going into, into this argument. So let me just say that uh, our next episode is going to be on arguing for and against God's existence, where we'll be discussing a little bit further detail of what these arguments could be. Right. Um, and we'll see you then. And as, 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 as always, uh, I just I should just mention that uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. So yeah. feel free to contact us, post them in the comments, or reach out in whatever means you uh, think is best. So uh, it just remains for me to thank Dimmer again for joining us on this show. And I look forward My pleasure. to the episode. My pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.